It is 1939 and Germany has annexed both Czechoslovakia and Austria. Their armies prepared to invade both Poland and the lowlands to the west. France and Great Britain stand as the only line of defense against the Nazi invasion. To the east, the Soviet armies amass as they prepare to also invade Poland. In the Pacific, the Japanese are at war with China as they expand their nation across the islands. It's up to you, Commander, to make the decisions to decide the outcome of the war. Will things change in 1945? Will the Axis become victorious or will the Allies win? It's your decisions now that you make in the game to decide the outcome. In this asymmetrical war game brought to you by Phalanx Games, you have the opportunity to live the war again as either the Axis or the Allies. Stay tuned for this deep dive with Game Brigade as we take a closer look at Domination. Welcome back everyone to Game Brigade. I'm your host, Brian Greer, and today we're taking a look at this World War II asymmetrical war game brought to you by Phalanx Games. So Phalanx Games sent me this copy of Domination to give you guys a preview of this new World War II war game live on Kickstarter right now. If you're interested in backing this game at the end of the video, they'll have a link down below so you can check it out. This is an asymmetrical two to four player war game set with either the Axis or the Allies. Now there are four factions that you can play, but they are allied with one another. So you'll have the Japanese and the Germans together, as well as the British and the Soviets. Now the British have the coalition army of the French, while the, uh, the Germans have a coalition army of the Italians. So they are a subset of those minor factions. Later, the British can have the, the US as a subset of them, as well as the Russians can have the Chinese be a subset coalition army for them. But those two armies, the United States and the China uh, Chinese, are not part of the main armies. They are coalition armies. And they'll be entered into the game using these two markers down here later. And we'll get to that much later. The idea of this game is you're going to be drafting cards, and on those cards, you'll be having several different options of uh, activities that you can do. Uh, we'll get in more detail of what those uh, options are, uh, but you'll be drafting the cards, passing them to your opponents, and there's a mechanic in this of, of deciding what cards do you want to keep, do I want to pass over more powerful cards to my, my opponent, or do I want to take their more powerful cards? Because every card has a specific faction that it's aligned to, and it helps that specific faction. So it might be more beneficial for you to take one of your own cards, or it might be more beneficial to take one of your opponent's cards during the draft. Once the draft is completed, you have the time marker here in the center that will determine which order goes first. The objective of this game is to complete, uh, complete domination using either territories, technologies, or gaining the favor of further nations. To do that, you'll be doing ac actions. There are several actions that you can take, such as research, technology, uh, move, attack, uh, rush, uh, shoot rockets, and all of these are available through the point cost system reflected on the cards. At the top of every um, map here, there's a star, and that will determine the amount of victory points that that territory is in control of. So as you're moving your armies across the board, following the directional um, markers here, you'll be gaining those stars, which will reflect and change on the victory track around the outside. The way the game is won is at the end of each year, so starting in 1939, ending in 1945, the has a marker here on the track, the victory track. There is a indication of the victory points as well as the year marker. So for a specific faction to win, they must be beyond the victory track in the set year. So for example, in 1939, the way for either faction, for either the Axis or the Allies to win, they must have 32 points or beyond 32 points. And as the game goes longer, the Axis point determination goes lower as the Allies gets larger. The point of that would be as the Americans get involved in the fight or as the Chinese get involved in the fight, their territories will become free points for the Allies, uh, which is quite a bit of stars, especially for the Americans. Uh, and so there's some balancing there to making sure that 
the 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 game f- plays somewhat similar to how real life was done and that's actually what i really liked about playing this game we played this several times now where the game truly did feel like it was balanced in a way that it felt sim- very similar to the how the real world war ii went the japanese spread very quickly across the pacific the, the Germans amassed a fairly large army and was able to control North Africa and somewhat bits of the Western Poland uh, over here. As And then the Soviet armies amassed a massive tank army and just came back through here to the West. The, uh, the Americans, depending on how you play, the way you enter America into the game, it can determine how quickly they can enter. By Japanese attacking them, of course, that angers the Americans and that can enter the war more quickly. But there's also land lease options that the uh, British can take or the Soviet can take to bring those uh, factions quicker to the war. And what I like about this game was how quickly you're allowed to bring in um, multiple different uh, options into the game. A lot of these war games have you know kind of narrow focuses what domination tries to do is have a lot of different options you've got a tech tree you've got your uh, land lease options you have uh, uh, missile launching you've got espionage you have the ability to do negotiations with other countries there's a lot here in a package of a 90 minute game and that's what i truly appreciate so let's go ahead and take a deeper look at the cards and what those cards mean. Here we have several different variations of the cards that you can play with. I wanted to show you th- several different ones and then we'll talk about what the symbols mean going in order. In the top corner here, we have the operational points. This number indicates how many points this card is worth when you discard it for operation activities. We'll cover those operational activities further when we talk about the technology tree, but this is a clear indication of what these cards are worth. In the opposite corner, we have the technology that this card can be discarded for to research that specific tech. You're allowed to research up to one technology per year, and this will further enhance your capabilities with either the Army, the Navy, or rockets, and we also have electronics. At the bottom of the card, you have specific actions or events. And these events are country specific. And here I have several options to show you. We have difference between, say, a German, a Japanese, and a British in the coloring. And when you do an event, if you are that specific faction, you can discard this card for its immediate effect. This is a diplomacy action, and this would get you two victory points for gaining favor with that nation. This is the deployment. So the Japanese player could deploy a tank, a a naval ship, as well as move a unit. And this is a special activity. The, The allies and the axes have two different special activities. And this allows you to paratroop some resistance forces as well as move a faction. I will leave those special rules to the rule book if you're interested in checking them out, but this is an example of what that would be. Let's go ahead and take a quicker look at the technology tree and get an idea of how those all kind of work together. So here we have the technology track. We have five different sections that you can research starting with the army in brown, electronics in yellow, navy in blue, rockets and missiles and bombs in orange, and espionage in purple. Each card will have a specific color icon that references its technology that it will research. For example, if we were to research this card, we find this symbol on the map, which is indicated here. We flip this card upside down and place it next to our technology track. At the end of the year, we reveal that card and we show everyone which color we researched. That then takes the colored cube and slides it up, covering up the OP costs. Up here are these OP costs to determine the activities that you can perform the game and their costs associated with them. So we have moving tanks, attacking tanks, deploying tanks. We have deploying naval ships, attacking naval ships, or moving naval ships. It's important to note that when you research the attacking naval ships or attacking army ships, 
that references your attacking of an opponent's light uh, ship or tank. For example, if I have a boat attacking a tank, I reference the attacking tank column even though I'm using a naval ship. That determines the cost for me to destroy a tank. This references the cost for me to destroy a ship. When you research technologies, as you slide these up, you cover up these OP costs, which reduce the, the, the costs to perform these activities. So now, instead of costing three to destroy a tank, it only costs me two. And instead of costing me three to deploy a tank, it only costs me two. While deploying a naval ship still costs me three. Further down the track, we have additional options here and here. These are more advanced options that allow you to reduce the cost even further of destroying a vehicle, but they have some prerequisites. You'll see that they are joined by this line here, which means I have to have all three of these specific techs researched here in the Army before I could research this dive bomber. And when I research this dive bomber, its cube will slide all the way up. And then this enables me to destroy tanks for the cost of one. As an added bonus, it also reduces the cost of trying, destroying naval ships as well. So this is a bonus to be able to increase this. And it also stacks. So if I had this researched completely, it would cost me only one to destroy a naval ship as well as one to destroy uh, an army ship. Radar and espionage, or um, enigma machine rather, uh, technically espionage as well, are one use per year items. When you research these items, you will take the cube and place it on the card, uh, the research card. So if I had one, let's see. So if I have a radar, we'll take the cube and place it adjacent to our technology board. What the radar card does is that when someone shoots a rocket at us, these rockets would make us discard a card at random. The radar reduces that effect by one. Each time you shoot a rocket, a rocket all the way to nuclear bomb, this increased goes up. So this will make you discard one card. This makes you discard two cards. This makes you discard three cards. The nuclear bomb is obviously a very powerful effect to have someone discarding three of their cards as the cards are what play this game since this is a card based war game. To enable to, de to deploy these higher advanced rockets, you have to unlock both a espionage action as well as the original rockets one. So once you've unlocked this and this, this will allow you to go down to the second tier. These two uh, espionage ones, the Enigma machine as well as spying, are great because the Enigma machine will let you draw an extra card at the end of the draft phase and then discarding one as well as the uh, espionage spying lets you look at opponents three of their cards and having them discard one of those three cards. They do get to draw a card in replacement, but you potentially can be sabotaging their best card. So this is the technology track for domination. Let's go ahead and take a look at the movement and the combat and explain how that works in further detail. All right, let's take a quick look at how combat works in the game of domination. And in this example, we have German forces pressuring the French. We have one tank here as well as one tank here. Whenever you're attacking, you must have a tank adjacent to the area you're attacking. Currently, only this location is adjacent to this location. We will then play our card and discard it for six OPs. So now we have six options of how we want to do it. For three OPs, it costs us to destroy a tank. So we'll spend three of the six OPs to destroy the French tank. Now we have an option for movement. The arrows will tell you which way you can move. Germany has several other options here for movement. They have a boat as well as two other Panzer tanks. But what can they move? When they move, they cannot send a naval ship first, even though this area, this territory, is a water territory and can hold a naval ship because of the lines it dictates that an army has to be moved first. So we would take a panzer across our supplies and gain control of France. And then this specific example, since Germany is now taking control of France, they take the French card, flip it, 
and showed that now Ger French are part of the German Empire. And potentially later in the game, the Germans could now recruit French armies to fight for them. Vice versa, if England were to take over Italy, that would happen as well, where now Italian forces could fight for the British. But let's say, for example, now that we have our movement complete, and this is a whole nother turn, can we move this naval ship here? Yes. As long as there's already a, a, a faction that we control this, we are now able to move our naval vessel to this territory. You just have to respect the rules in regards to islands, land territories, and coastal cities. Remember, tanks cannot move their, end, their movement in an island, and boats cannot end their movement in a land space. That doesn't work. This is how combat works in Domination. Okay, everyone, and that is my preview for Domination, this World War II war game brought to you by Phalanx Games. I was so honored for having them send me this game to, pro to try it out and to preview it for you guys, and I hope I did it justice. We had a lot of fun the last two nights playing this game, learning the mechanics, and really seeing how the different ways the decision makings can impact the war. In our first game, the Axis armies were just totally annihilated as the Soviet Empire really created a huge army and just roll over the Germans. But in our second game, different technology choices as well as decisions by the Japanese and the German player allowed the Germans to really just control the game. I love the fact that you can change the outcome of the war into different sides. Uh, and I like how the game really does play well into a historically accurate in terms of thematic, a uh, close representation of a World War II war game. For everything that's in this game, it is shocking to know that it can be completed in 90 minutes. That is, to me, is the most exciting part of Domination. The fact that I can get a full-fledged war game in about an hour and a half. You don't see that very often in a game with this much depth. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave me a, a comment down below. I've played two games of this, like I said. I feel like I have a fairly, a fairly good idea of how the game plays. Now, this is obviously a prototype that I was sent, so components and rules and everything potentially could change, and that's great. And if you want more information on that, I would tell you to check out the Kickstarter because that's gonna where you're going to get the most accurate information regarding domination. But in terms of the current state of the game, I would love to answer any questions you may have. If you have any other additional comments, please leave them down below. If you like this comment or comp content, please leave a subscription and click the little bell for notifications. Anyways, this is Brian from Game Brigade. I hope you enjoyed this preview of Domination. We'll see you next time.